today, and there's, you hear me say it before, but there's really nothing more beautiful than a woman who's walked with God for a long time, and, uh, and I have great respect for, for the mothers in the, in the world, and, uh, and my mom was my hero, my rock star, and, but I just have a soft spot for, for moms. Um, I was the kind of kid, though, that was always demanding of my mom, you know, even as a little kid. Uh, even after she put me to bed, she might say, I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be that kid that'd be laying in bed saying, hey, mom, can you bring me a glass of water after she's already put me to bed? If you see that kid, anybody ever do that? Can I get an amen on that? And she would, uh, and mom would say, it's too late for that. You're already in bed. Call it a night. And I would press it, you know, and I would, a few minutes later, I'd holler out, ma, can I get a glass of water? Will you bring me a glass of water? And mom would say, if you ask me again, I'm going to come in there and spank you. And I'd ask again, only this time I'd say, Ma, when you come in to spank me, will you bring me a glass of water? <laughs> I'll take the whipping, all right? I'll take the whipping. Just bring me a glass of water, you know, just not stay off it. But, but God bless the, the moms in our life, you know, for everything that they, they stand for. Our scripture this morning, as we read it, says, As for children, obey your parents and the Lord because it's right. And it's the first commandment that has a promise attached to it. If you look at that, it says, honor your mother and father is the first one with the promise attached so that the things will go well for you and you will live a long time in this world. And so you think about that promise, and it's really true. If you, if you fail to honor your parents, it's going to be a tough life for you. I can guarantee it will be. I will promise you. So it's one of the greatest commandments we have is to honor our parents. So... I don't know where you're on your spiritual journey, but I hope that you make this a priority in your life, um, honoring your parents. It's just a big deal. We've all fallen short of it. None of us have done it perfectly, but it's imperative that we do it, um, and for a good reason. My mother uh, was born in the Depression. My mom grew up in the city of St. Louis. Um, her parents, were, her dad was a barber. Her mom was a beautician. They lived on Cherokee Street. For anybody who knows St. Louis City, they lived in a little apartment above the shops. They were one of the, you know, one families that were really blessed to have an occupation during that time because a lot of people weren't working, but they were working. And so mom had that gift of learning how to cut hair. And, uh, but, but her parents died really young. I never knew any of my grandparents, great-grandparents on either side of the family. Never had the privilege to have any of that. But my mom, um, she lost her parents very young. So it was, it was tragic for her to lose her parents. And her mom went first. Her mom died in her 40s. Her dad died in his, in his 50s. And uh, mom was left to uh, really do her own thing. My mom uh, married a guy who was a pretty tough alcoholic. You know, he was an alcoholic and uh, I think pretty abusive. And out of that marriage came my brother and two sisters. Um, that's what came out of that marriage. And uh, so they grew up, they, she grew up in that, that lifestyle, that family dynamic, that setting that was pretty horrific, really, in all causes. And so she stayed in that marriage as long as she could. She stayed in it to where she couldn't take it anymore, until she almost lost her mind, and then she left the marriage. That's a big question mark, it's a big mystery for our family, because there's about a 10-year, 11-year period where mom's, my mom's life was just a, a blank. Nobody knows where she's at. Those kids, my brothers and sisters, never had any contact with her. They didn't even know if she was still alive. Um, so it was a pretty tragic thing in their life. My mom had her own challenges. We don't really know what those were, but we know it was bad enough that she ended up in a state mental hospital in the Beta, Missouri. That's where my mom ended up, and my mom spent a few years there, um, and after, I guess, getting to a place where she could be okay on her own, they finally let her out, and when she got out, um, she didn't have anybody. There was nobody left in her family. There was no brothers, no sisters, no aunts, no uncles, no grandparents, nobody. There was absolutely nobody to hook up to. And she ended up hooking up with another guy who happened to be my dad. And my dad, I think, was a lot like the, the relationship she had before with my brother and sister's dad. He was a pretty hard drinker, kind of rough, I think, a little bit of an abuser, maybe a little bit of a carouser, a womanizer. I don't know he probably had you know, different characteristics. But it wasn't very long in that marriage. I came out of that marriage, but about the age of two or three, my mom finally just had enough, and uh, she... Uh, she left it. She told him he had to get on down the road, hit the road jack, don't ever come back, no more, no more, no more, no more. You know that song, right? And, uh, and she decided that uh, she was just going to do this thing on her own, and she gave her life to Jesus, and she never looked back. I mean, my mom was a very devout Catholic from that point forward. She, she was brought up in the Catholic faith as a young girl. She went back to that and never looked back. 
and lived an incredible life after that um, and became one of the heroes of my life. Now, I had the privilege of being with my mom my whole life. My brothers and sisters didn't. Um, so I'm referred to in the family as the golden child. Maybe you're the golden child. Maybe you're the scapegoat in the family. I don't know where you fall into the family tree. That's just where my life is at growing up with my mom. We didn't have any money. My mom worked dead-end jobs most of the time to keep a roof over her head. And from about age five to seven, we shared the bathroom with the lady next door. Didn't have a lot going on for us. But although I didn't know that that really wasn't that bad a shape, I mean, I, I was pretty ignorant to what life was about. But I did have a mom that gave me two things in life. My mom instilled to me the, the, the introduction to Jesus Christ in my life, and she told me she loved me on most days. And those two variables, those two points, made a huge difference in how my life turned out, ultimately. So I can't stress that enough, how important that was for that. What's that noise? Okay. So I heard, I heard some noise. Um, but anyway, so what happened was right around seven or eight, my mom introduced me, and I, I met my brother and sisters for the first time. I didn't even know they existed to that point. So I found out we made a couple trips to Illinois, a couple trips to Missouri, and I, and I met these people. I don't remember any of it. I just see pictures of when I was about this tall, just a squirt, meeting these people for the first time. But about age nine, somewhere right around age nine, my mom said, we're going to move, and we're moving to a suburb of St. Louis, and we're moving to Arnold, Missouri. And uh, we're moving into a mobile home park, um, which was a big step up from where I was living. And we moved into this mobile home park, and all for the main reason for her to be able to be close to this brother and two sisters so they could reconcile that broken relationship. I mean, almost every problem we have in life, we, spiritually or humanly, we can, uh, we can take it back to a broken relationship in our life. And, uh, and that was the case in her life. But we moved there, and, uh, and that started a whole new chapter in my mom's life. And so I got to start meeting my brother and my two sisters, and that relationship started to form. Um, but that's the background I come from. And uh, looking at your own lives, looking at your own mothers, and I know many of your mothers are sitting here right here in a room with us. You've had a tremendous ride with your mom. And, and how amazing is that? I mean, just really when you stop and think about it, how blessed you are to have the mother that you have in your life. And there may be some here that didn't have that experience. You know, you didn't have that motherly figure in your life for whatever reason. And if that's the case for you, I at least hope that somewhere along the line you had some female step into that role in your life whether it was an aunt or a grandma or a close friend, somebody who provided that motherly hen love that, we were that Jesus was talking about with the apostles and we read about in the call to worship today. I hope that that happened for you. And if it didn't, you know, my heart breaks for you because that's a big deal. Now, there is, you know, I was raised by a single mom who played the father, who played the grandparents, who played the uncles, and she was a very girly mom. So, you know, she wasn't one of those athletic type like Melinda and some of the other ones we have in our, you know, in our in our congregation she was not athletic so the downsides of being raised by a single mom is you learn to throw a ball like this you know it doesn't work out too good for you in the playground when you throw a ball like that you know the macho guys i was around and you run kind of dorky for a while so you figure out it's not cool and the birds and the bees talk is a lot different from a mom who was married to two alcoholics uh, because the moral of the story is all bees are scumbags that's the moral of the story when she when she lays that on you so a little bit challenging being raised by a single mom. But, but some of you had that blessing to be raised by just a great mom who did a lot of things. And so if you had to come up with words to describe your mom, you know, what would some of those words look like? What would they be? For some of you might say, you know, my mom is my best friend. She's been my best friend my whole life. Others might say, hey, daddy, you rock, but mom is the bomb, right? You might just put it all on mom. We know the athletes. I see them all the time and watch the sports my whole life. It never fails. The kid will win a Heisman Trophy. A kid will win a championship. doesn't matter who it is. And they're on there, and the, the news reporter goes over and goes, well, who do you want to thank? And it's always mom. I want to thank my mom. Maybe dad gets a little kudos in there, but typically it's mom. It gets all the love, even in that situation. So it's interesting to think about just how important moms are in our role. So t today, God had a lot to say about moms in uh, God's gave the moms the gifts that they had to be able to be the moms that they are. So today we're going to look at some scriptures. And one of them right off the bat is this is Jesus on the cross. This is Jesus Christ on the cross, giving up his life for you and I. And this is what he says to the apostle John. And this is what he says to his own mother. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. It's an important scripture 
because it shows you how much Jesus cared for his mother and how much he cared for her welfare once that he was no longer here. Even though the Holy Spirit would be with her, he still wanted humans to look after her. And so this whole idea of mother and child is an important deal in the realm of Christ. And so we're going to look today, and that's what we're going to spend our time on. We're going to look at three takeaways, and we're going to do that really right in connection with what Kate just shared with us. We're going to look at this story a little bit, but we're going to dive into three points. And, and Kate brought these out. King Solomon <clears throat> was the Judge Judy of the day. Or some of you are old enough to remember Court TV with Judge Wapner. Some of you watched that show. Um, you know, that's, that was King Solomon. There were two trials of two moms. One was a terrible mom. One was a, a great mom. And Kate brought that out. But we had Solomon, who was a pretty clever guy. You know, as Kate pointed out, he didn't have the science of today. But, you know, he says, bring a sword out and we'll, uh, we'll cut him in half. And, uh, and he knew that the real mother would speak up. And she did. <clears throat> and that's the good news of the story. Because mothers have a certain characteristic about them. And this mother, in this case, was no way going to let any harm come to that child. Just keep it. I'd much rather just give the child away as opposed to the child losing its life. So the first thing I want to look at today is really three takeaways. But the first one is mothers know their children. And mothers do know your children, I can guarantee. Even as a little kid, they could be in a nursery with a bunch of other squawkers going on. And you know the squawk, right? You know which one's yours. It's just part of God's instinct that comes into it. You know their mannerisms. You know what's up with them. You know when they're hurting. You know when they're, there's something going on inside them. You know. But what's even more important than that is, is that God gave them that ability. And therefore, God knows his children better than moms can even know their children. And I think that's something we forget sometimes. Our mothers know their kids pretty well, but God knows as well. And if we look at Psalm 22.10... Psalm 22 10 says, I, I was thrown on you from birth. You've been my God since I was in my mother's womb. I mean, there's so many scriptures that tell us when a child is a child and it's in the womb of their mother. And it's an amazing thing. Psalm 139 13 says, Even there your hand would guide me, even there your strong hand would hold me tight. And Jeremiah 29 11, 12 says, I know the plans. I have in my mind for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for peace, not disaster, to give you a future filled with hope. When you call me and come and pray with me, I will listen to you. I mean, those are pretty powerful words coming from our Lord telling us how well he knows you and I from the womb. There's a surgeon, you know, today they do these amazing surgeries, and there's a certain, this is all the way back in the late 90s, early 2000s, but there was a surgery out in Arizona where this particular doctor was the, the, the high-risk pregnancy doctor that would actually go in and operate on the fetus inside the womb. Think about that. That's insane that, that you could even do that. How would you like to do that for the first surgery? Be the first one to ever do that surgery. But he, in this particular case, the story goes that he went inside this uterus and pulled out this child, or, or got into work on this child that was 21 days old, and this child had a spinal problem. I think it was spinal bifida. But he went in to do a surgical procedure on the spine of that child at 21 days old, so it would make a difference in this child's life. And this rumor has it out of that story that by the time the surgery is over, that little, little bitty hand of that 21-year-old, 21-day child reached up and grabbed his finger and grabbed a hold of it and squeezed it. You know, almost like a courtesy, almost like a thank you, um, before they, you know, attach that all back. And there's pictures of that. You can see that on, on the Internet still today of that story. But it's just an amazing story to show that how precious life is and how much God was invested in us even at that point. God knew us better than anything on the planet. And he knows everything that he wills for our life. We all are born with a purpose. But our mothers know us pretty well. But those gifts all come from God. God gives the mothers those gifts, and it's uh, pretty cool just how well they know their children. The next point is moms feel their children's pain, and they truly do. Moms have deep compassion for their kids. When, I was, when we moved to that trailer park when I was just a kid, my, I never had a new bicycle. I never had a new tricycle. I never had a new wagon. I never had anything new. If I had something, it's because somebody gave it to me, or, or it was a hand-me-down of some type, or it was bought at a flea market. But I never had anything brand new. And here I am, I'm, I'm 10 years old by this time. And my mom finally saved her nickels and bought me a brand new Huffy bicycle in the box. She still had to put it together. It came in the box, she brought it home. I was never so excited. 
Brought it home, we ripped that thing open, we started trying to put it together. We, you know, we put the numbers, had a little number logo on it, and you put those on with bread ties, and you had this little handlebar with a crossbar on it, and you put a piece of foam and wrap a piece of lead around it and snap it on. It was the bomb. I was knobby tires. I was, I was never so happy. And my buddy Kenny come down, and, uh, and, and the, his mom was out of town, so he asked me to come up and spend a night, and I went up and spent a night with him, took, rode my bike up there, came out the next morning, and it was gone. Somebody had stole my bike. I didn't have it 24 hours. And, uh, and I was bummed out. But my mom was even more bummed out. Uh, she was just brokenhearted, and uh, she really struggled with that for quite a while, just not understanding why all that effort, all that energy in that, that went in to get that thing, and then, and then something like that would happen. It was really hard for her to digest that. But my mom had a lot of compassion, because mom feels her children's pain. And I can promise you mom's feel her children's pain. Matthew 15, 32 just shows you just how comforting God is, how Jesus really had compassion for you and I and for the people. And this story is about the, the 4,000. And he's looking out among the 4,000, and Jesus called his disciples and said, I feel very sorry for the crowd because they have been with us for three days and have nothing to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry, for I fear they won't have enough strength to travel. And that's Jesus, and he's worried about the welfare of the people. And, uh, and that's a commission on our life, to be worried about the people that are still hungry and need things in our life. But, but it just shows you how compassionate our God is. But it also shows you where our moms get their compassion for their children. I'm not saying guys don't have compassion. We have compassion for our kids, there's no doubt. But man, we're not as near as compassionate as kids. I mean, if we were left to watch our kids for three days, you know, we may not feed them for three days. We're just busy doing whatever we're doing. They, they, they're complaining about something to eat. We're like, go get some ice. There's a whole freezer full of ice. Eat some ice. You know, we'll let them, we'll let them starve for a while. We'll even let the kids cry for a while. We're not going to run right to them right when they squawk. I mean, what is it, about five minutes? We'll let them, let them squawk for five minutes. If they don't quiet down, maybe we'll finally get up and go in and see what's going on. We just don't have the patience and compassion that, that, uh, that moms do. And it's for good reason. Isaiah 53, 4 says, It was certainly our sickness that he carried and our sufferings that he bore, but we thought him afflicted, struck down by God, and tormented. God uh, seen the suffering, and he's seen the affliction on the people, and it, and it broke his heart. Luke 19, 41 says, And Jesus came to the city and he observed, and he wept over it. He wept over the, the suffering that humankind was going under. And, and I think we spend too much time as people sometimes so focused on the sin instead of the suffering. We make a big deal out of sin, I think a much bigger deal than God does, personally. I think God makes a much bigger deal out of the suffering than the sin itself. It's kind of like the old scripture that says, you know, why are you so worried about the speck in your neighbor's eye when you've got a whole telephone pole in your eye? But I think Jesus even goes on to say, but why are you even worried about the telephone pole in your own eye? Why don't you look at the suffering that you're suffering from? Look at what it's costing you. Look at what it's causing you. Look what it's causing the people around you. There's a tremendous amount of suffering. That's what God was really brokenhearted about. He didn't want to see his people suffer. And it's the same way in our life today. When we fall short of the glory of God and we suffer, God doesn't just focus in on that one thing that we compromise our spiritual walk with. He focuses on the suffering. It breaks his heart to see us be hurt. The same way it breaks your heart when you see people that you care about hurt. If one of your kids does something wrong, yeah, you're gonna, there's going to be a discipline in the action that took wrong, but you're really going to be concerned about their welfare. That's what you're going to be concerned about. You just want them to be okay. So it's important that we understand it about our suffering. I think we spend way too much time trying to figure out how to quit the, doing the sin. I think if we focused on the suffering a little bit, the impact from that would be so great, it may just turn us from the sin. And we really start counting the cost of what our actions do for us. Luke 13, 34, Jesus gives the analogy that came out that, that Kate led us through in the call to worship. In uh, 34, it says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stone those who were sent to you, how often have I wanted to gather you, your people, just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you didn't want that. And it's just, again, showing you the compassion Jesus has for our life, that you, many of you raised chickens, uh, or been around chickens your whole life, you understand how, how protective a mother hen is, how defenseless they are, really in a big scheme of things, but how protective they are. That's any animal. I don't care if, you're, if it's cattle, if it's, if it's hogs, if it's deer, if it's a dog. 
Their, their instinct that God gave them is to do what, what they were called to do as a mother. And they're very defensive and very protective. And that, Jesus used that metaphor of a hen gathering her little chicks under her wing to protect them. But yet gives us a free will where we can just ignore the call. ignore We just don't want to be under the wing. I just want to do my own thing. I don't want to be under the wing. I don't want to be under your care. And our lives show that. But as, as women, you know, moms, you know, we realize this is the point number three. Moms make a huge sacrifice for their kids. Moms do a lot of things. Moms give up their careers a lot of times in order to be at home, to stay at home. Moms give, sometimes have to work two jobs because we live in an economy now where sometimes both spouses have to work. So not only do they go to work all day, but then they got to come home and be mom on top of it. And I think sometimes we can easily overlook just what they do, how much sacrifice that those kids, that those moms really put out into the world. My mom sacrificed a lot. She worked two or three jobs, and that's no joke. Most of her life, I mean, I mean leave in the morning and come home 9 or 10 o'clock at night. You know, after just doing the grind all day, just enough to pay the electric bill and have some food to eat every day. And I so underappreciated that for most of my life until I got older in life. But moms give up countless hours with their kids. You know, and a lot of you grew up in a time where dad was a breadwinner working all the time. So mom was home and she did everything. She was the coach. She took him to practice. She picked him to the dances. She went to the recitals. She did all the stuff, the grind, the grind, the grind. They sacrifice a lot. But uh, when we think about it, and we think about what God sacrificed for us to even put women in that place, women have a lot of mojo. Mom's got some great mojo. But as Hebrew 10.10 10 tells us, it's Jesus who paid the ultimate sacrifice. You know, Jesus came for one reason, and that was to become the final and complete sacrifice for each and every one of us. And uh, we can never forget that. Mom sacrificed a lot, but Jesus paid it all. And that's ultimately what we want to take home. Moms have so many characteristics of Jesus that it's not even funny. It truly is. So we owe our moms a lot. Really, for some of us, we owe them everything. But we definitely owe our salvation and the privilege that one day in the future, if your mom's already passed or she passes at some time in the future before you do, that you will be reunited with your mom in eternity because that's what Christ's death promises us that we'll have eternal life, that we'll have salvation. So the beauty of it is I know I'll reconnect with my mom. My mom died in 2015, just uh, not even six months before I came here. And uh, it was a, wasn't an expected thing. My mom got ill. She got pneumonia in one lung. She went to the hospital in that summer, summer 2015, said it's pneumonia, gave her some treatment for two or three days, sent her home. She never recovered. Susie and I went to see her one day. We walked in to look at her. I mean, we could just, she was laying in the couch one in the afternoon and couldn't even hardly sit up. And we knew that, that that just wasn't who my mom was. And then the next day, she's taken to the hospital, has this pneumonia, this fluid on her lung. And uh, I knew it wasn't good. They did the biopsy on it and finally figured out that it was stage four cancer, small cell cancer, worst cancer you could have, same cancer her dad had. Um, and my mom lived a total of eight days after that. So she never walked out of the hospital. And it was, a tough, it was a tough time because when your mom was your dad, your uncles, your grandparents, she was all that, and she dies, you basically lose your entire family in one swoop. And that's what I was experiencing during that time. But the, the good part of that was with my mom was that I was good with my mom. There was no friction. There was no regrets between me and my mom. I had cleaned up anything I had done in the past. I had been there for my mom for a good almost 30 years of her life. Um, present in her life, active in her life, appreciative in her life, and I'll never regret it. Because I can promise you, there's only two things you're ever going to be able to stand in front of the mirror and say about your mother. You're either going to be able to say, man, I'm glad I took the time to really be a part of her life and be engaged with that. Or you're going to say, I wish I would have. And that's it. What else are you going to be able to say? And I'm glad I can stand here today and say, man, I'm glad I took the time to be a part of my mom's life. We were up there, Susie and I were up there along with my daughters and, and, uh, and my sisters. We were there with her in her last hours. And my mom's last words, I, I had a little CD player with some earphones on it, little foam earphones, some cheap little CD thing. And I took the earphones. She hadn't been awake in a long time. And I went to put these earphones on her. And as soon as that foam hit her ears, her eyes opened up a little bit. And you could just see the death in her eyes. And she's like, looked at me. She couldn't talk really, but she looked at me like, what are you doing? I said, hey, mom. It's okay. I said, I'm just putting on some Frank Sinatra for you. 
And, and her last words, she whispered it, but she, her last words were, well, everybody needs a little blue eyes. And that was my mom's last words. And uh, put the earphones on and she died the next morning. Um, my sisters, my siblings and all that asked me to do the eulogy. And it was the toughest thing I ever did in my life. I didn't even know if I was going to be able to do it. I was that emotional before it even took place. But I was able to get through it by the help of the Holy Spirit. But what I'm telling you is, and the lessons here, is that moms are important. That's Mama Long. That was one of her last pictures that she ever had, you know, when she had it all together. Um, but moms are awesome. I gave you a lot of reasons why moms are awesome. But they're awesome because they have so many characteristics of Jesus Christ. They have so many characteristics of what it means to be a godly person. So when I tell you that there's nothing more beautiful than a woman who's walked with God for a long time, it's the truth. And you know those people in your life. So I don't know where you're at on your spiritual journey, but I hope today that you take some time, if your mom's still alive, and really tell her how much you appreciate her. If she's not here anymore, I hope you take some time to just get a cup of coffee, get a soda, even get a beer. Go out and sit by yourself somewhere and just think about your mom. Think about the lessons and blessings that you had with that lady in your life. Think about if she was still here today, what would she speak into your heart? What would she speak into your life? What would she have you do different than you're doing now? How would she have you behave and how would she have you act and what would she have you doing that maybe you're not doing? How would she still get on your case? I know for my mom, I'd still ask her to get me a drink of water. You know, <laughs> Ma, that's the first thing I'll ask her for. Where's the water when I get to heaven? But it's a beautiful thing. So mothers, thank you for being who you are. I hope you have a blessed day. I'm sure you have already. I'm sure you will as time goes through the day. And uh, we owe a lot to our moms, and let's never forget that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the mothers here. Just tremendous, tremendous examples of what it means to be a godly woman. So many in front of us, right here, right now. And uh, we can never forget that. We need to watch them, learn from them, respect them, honor them, get behind them, support them in every walk in life. And for the mothers who are yet to be mothers, the young ladies here that will eventually be mothers in the days and years to come, we, uh, we lift them up to you. We hope that you can look at these examples you have around you and, and know what it means to be a godly person, to know what it means to be a godly woman and to raise godly children. It's so imperative that you learn that lesson, and we hope that you've learned that lesson. For all the youngsters, I hope that you take heed to our scripture that we started with, to honor your parents. I pray that the Holy Spirit gives you the strength to do that, that you never lose sight of who they are. Respect them and protect them with everything you got. Just like Jesus told the apostle, this is your mother, now take care of her, that we are called to do that for the ladies in our life. Not just our moms, but other seniors, other moms that just may not have that caregiver in their life. God has commissioned us to make sure they're taken care of. We all have a huge responsibility to the ladies in our life, to the moms in our life. So let's pray that the Holy Spirit gives us the strength to meet that demand because that's the only way it's going to be possible. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray these things. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen. Amen. All right. So at this time, we will have our closing.